Hello, I'm Rich Eisenberg, Editor-in-Chief of Inorganic Chemistry. As part of our 50th anniversary celebration, we're bringing to you interviews with true leaders in the field of inorganic chemistry, how they achieve their professional success and, and uh, what advice they can offer to us uh, as we go forward. Today's guest is one of the real luminaries of inorganic chemistry, Professor Richard R. Schrock from MIT. Dick has been um, a leader in terms of how we understand the bonding between metal and carbon. Uh, he has literally transformed the way we think about that. Dick has been honored numerous times, uh, notably with the ACS uh, Awards, first, the first award in organometallic chemistry, the uh, 1996 award in inorganic chemistry, and more recently the F.A. Cotton Award in synthetic inorganic chemistry. But probably most important, uh, Dick has won the Nobel Prize in 2005 in chemistry, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome, Dick. Thank you. I'd like to start with uh, how uh, the early Schrock years, uh, let's say, led you on to the success that you've had and how you, how you came to chemistry as uh, your life's uh, profession. And you're talking about early, early, right? Sure. <laughs> well, I guess I've always been interested in the natural world. I lived out the edge of town and I'd go out in the woods and so on. And, and was always interested in fossils and things like that. And then my older brother gave me a chemistry set when I was eight. So he was 13, just going into high school. And he was quite successful in chemistry, but um, he spotted in me maybe that I would become a chemist or that I would be interested in doing experiments. So that really became what I did for some years. Okay. Now, I know that you went to Riverside and then you went on to Harvard for um, your graduate studies. Tell us a little bit about uh, the Harvard years and even the uh, postdoc years that followed that. So when I went to Harvard, I went to Harvard as a physical chemist. I know that's hard to believe, but that's what I thought I was going to do. And I was a little disappointed because I couldn't really make things, which is what I wanted to do. And uh, I found there was a, a guy who just arrived named John Osborne. And he was looking for somebody to uh, you know, take on as a student. And so I talked to him and I liked what I heard and I could make things and maybe do some catalysis. And, and so I was John's first student. And then when you went to Cambridge? When I went to Cambridge, so that was in 1971. And I went to uh, work for Jack Lewis. I guess uh, I, I wanted, I'd just been married, so I wanted to go somewhere interesting, and I thought that would be an interesting position. Certainly Jack was a, a luminary in his field, cluster chemistry and the like, um, but I think it was the idea of going abroad that really, uh, oh, I also got a fellowship to, to pay for it, which helped, certainly. Good. <laughs> was, uh, what kind of chemistry were you doing at that time? In Jack's group? Yeah. So I, I was pretty much left on my own uh, because he was quite busy because of um, the death of, um, I've forgotten who it was now, Ron, I can't recall. Um, oh, Nyholm. Nyholm. Yeah. Uh, in November of the year when I was there. So Jack, being uh, the guy he was, took on all of Nyholm's responsibilities and was spending a lot of time away from the lab. So. I was pretty much left alone. I can't say I did anything very significant, except toward the end, I realized that uh, one could use cyclooctatetrine dianion as a ligand. And that, that figures in the story of how I discovered alkylidines later on at, at DuPont. Let's go to that, because you, you moved from Cambridge to DuPont. Correct. And, uh, it was during that time, you were at DuPont for three, four years? Three years, 72 to 75. Right, and seminal work occurred there. So tell us, how did you get into it? What were you thinking about? What were you trying to do well, when it all started? At that time, of course, DuPont 
let you do whatever you thought was interesting for a while, usually about three years, and uh, yet tie it to something that they were interested in, like polymerization of olefins. And so that's, that was my excuse to explore some organometallic chemistry of tantalum, which I had never barely heard of. And uh, the organometallic chemistry was very slim, shall we say. So that's what I did with the excuse that maybe I could make a new catalyst for polymerizing olefins. And so this is where the cycloactyl tetraene dianion comes in because I discovered that somebody had made tantalum alkyls, a guy named Juvenal. And that was in 68, I believe. He published a paper reacting dialkyl zincs with tantalum pentachloride and making tantalum alkyl halides. So I made one of them, trimethyl tantalum dichloride, and put the cycloactyl tetraene dianion on it, made a beautiful blue crystalline compound, which I don't think anybody has ever made since, but it's a nice compound. And that is what got me interested in tantalum alkyls. Which was the first of the alkylidine complexes that you made? The first one was trineopentyl neopentylidine tantalum. So that <clears throat> came from a, an attempt to make, well, I should say that after I discovered these alkyls, uh, Jeffrey Wilkinson, who was my chemical grandfather, came through, he was a consultant for DuPont, and told us that he had just made hexamethyl tungsten, which back then was a pretty amazing compound. Tungsten hexachloride, tungsten hexamethyl, same thing, except that metal carbon bonds were thought to be pretty weak. And so I had trimethyl tantalum dichloride in my dry box, and guess what I did with it? I made pentamethyl tantalum, which was a lot less stable than tungsten hexa hexamethyl. But it got me started on thinking, you know, what, what else I could make. So I made ones with alkyls, pentalkyls with bigger alkyls, like pentabenzyl, which is stable at room temperature, and then tried to make pentaneopentyl, which doesn't exist as far as we know because it decomposes to give neopentane and the neopentylidine trineopentyl. So how did you find that that one was different? What was, what did you do that showed you it was uh, a neopentylidine and not a diopental ligand? I guess the best indication of that was the NMR. Uh, the carbon NMR had a very low field shift around 220 parts per million. And there was this strange proton signal that had an area of one uh, and it was more complex than the NMR spectrum was more complex than pentaneopentyl should be. It should be you know, sort of two signals, basically, in the proton NMR. So it was more complicated. And then I, uh, I got a mass spec which showed that that fragment, trineopentyl neopentylidine, was present, and then a molecular weight to show that it was a monomer. Would you have described that as a and I'll use quotes, a eureka moment, a special moment. Did you realize that you had something that was totally new, never been seen before? I did realize it. And I think it was that day or maybe the next day when I became sure of what I had, I, I went home and told my wife that I think I've done something interesting. I don't know if I said interesting or important, but I, I've done something that I, was, I thought was really exciting. Now another person who was at DuPont at the time was George Parshall and he had spent some time with Jeffrey Wilkinson if I remember right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What uh, do you remember his reaction when you uh, were talking about this? Uh, George was a, is a wonderful guy, was to me back then, was my, my supervisor. Uh, I wouldn't call George excitable. I mean he was very <laughs> <laughs> very even-tempered, and so he probably said, oh, that sounds very interesting, or something like that, but uh, I don't think he jumped up and down too much. There was somebody who did jump up and down, and that was a, a, another consultant named Grant Urey, and he was at Tufts at the time, and, and when I told him about that, he started jumping up and down, literally, uh, and he said, why don't you try and react that with a ketone? 
it's, it's a tantalum vitig reagent. And he was jumping up and down, and he was exactly right. At what point did you connect it to um, metathesis, olefin metathesis, and to polymerization? Uh, the first time I heard the word metathesis was from Earl Mutertes. Now, Earl was one of six, six associate directors at the time, yet he still found time to come into the lab. And one day, I found him in my lab taking some black material in a tube out of a furnace. And I said, oh, hi, Earl, and what, what are you doing? He said, I'm making a metathesis catalyst. And I said, what's a, what did you say? A metathesis, oh, what's a metathesis catalyst? And he held it up and it was a black material in a tube and then told me about metathesis. And that was in 71, I would say, probably the fall of 71 before he left to move to Cornell. And I would say that that was the, the beginning of my interest in metathesis because then I began reading about it. Bob Grubbs and Chuck Casey and Tom Katz were all studying, so were other people, uh, this, this fantastic new reaction, which is pretty bizarre, and the explanations for it were pretty bizarre in the beginning. But I thought, maybe, maybe what I'm doing is actually relevant to that. Tantalum carbon double bond, carbon carbon double bond. And then you started to do that work at MIT, I think. Uh, yeah, I took, I took the chemistry to MIT. They were nice enough to allow me to do that. And I did some of the first experiments to show that those alkylidines do react with olefins and make metallocyclobutanes as intermediates, but they don't metathesize olefins catalytically, or at least not for very long. The metallocycle is unstable and, and decomposes by rearranging. So that's what uh, really led me to obviously move further to the right where it was known that tungsten and molybdenum would in fact uh, metathesize olefins and maybe I could make a high oxidation state tungsten or molybdenum species. And when did you start to work on um, ring opening metathesis polymerization? How did that uh, come about? Actually, the first time I ever, I shouldn't say me personally, and one of my students did a reaction, ring opening metathesis, was uh, when I moved to uh, Caltech, or, or went to Caltech for six months, I believe, as a Fairchild scholar, and took one of the first, what I call well-defined catalysts, imidoalkylidine, bisalkoxide catalyst, tungsten, uh, bistibutoxide, and um, collaborated with Bob Grubbs, in fact, and uh, one of his students showed that it would ring open, polymerize norbornene, and that really began to open up my view towards uh, polymer chemistry. Now, you've also been able to use your catalyst uh, very successfully in organic synthesis in collaboration with uh, Amir Hoveda. Uh, how did you establish that collaboration? And uh, I think that has really proven extremely uh, valuable. Uh, That's a fantastic collaboration. So that, I was just out to dinner last night with Amir and some friends, and I said, Amir, you realize that this is our 14th year. We're going into our 14th year. So in August of 1997, at a Gordon conference where Amir was, I came and told him that I had just made an asymmetric, uh, C2 symmetric biphenylate on the metal catalyst, metathesis catalyst. And wouldn't that be interesting to do some asymmetric metathesis reactions? And he was interested in metathesis chemistry, a lot of other you know, you know, beautiful organometallic chemistry and their applications to organic synthesis. And he said right away, he said, yes, let's do it. And that with an attitude like that, it's gone a long way. And it's a perfect fit, I think, in terms of our expertise and our personalities. And we are continuing in our 14th year. And a couple of years ago, we made a pretty significant discovery that's really changed things dramatically. And so I think we'll go on for some time. Let me ask about um, the Nobel Prize. Uh, when you won it, um, how did you find out about it, and how, how has it affected uh, uh, everything that's gone on since then? 
I found out about it, uh, I think it was October 5th at 5.30 in the morning. So they meet on a given day, it's well advertised, and vote. Of course, it's all pretty much established up to that point that somebody is going to be the one or two or three, up to three people can receive it. And so I knew that that day was going to be the day, but you know, you just go on with your life and then the phone rang at 5.30 which is so the six hour time difference, so 11.30 or so in the morning after they had voted, presumably starting at nine or so. So wherever the recipient is in the world, they try to call that person anytime, day or night. So you found out at uh, 5.30 in the morning, where were you? I was at home, I'd just gotten up. I get up around five often, drinking some coffee, checking my email. And the and phone then rang. The phone started yeah. ringing. Yes, the phone rang, and I picked it up downstairs, but I forgot I had a phone that you had to actually push the button so that you were connected. So I, I said hello, and there's no answer. My wife picked up the phone upstairs, which was a direct line, and she called down to me and she said, I think you should come up here. <laughs> <laughs> and then. Uh, I guess two months later, uh, you spent time in Stockholm. Yes. Yeah. So October 5th, November, December 1, no, 10 is the date. And obviously it's changed, uh, it's changed in some ways your life. Uh, how? Well, a lot of people know who I am. <laughs> And uh, so I, I am asked, was, it's calmed down quite a bit now, but uh, I was asked to all sorts of things. The first two years, they say, and I found out it's true, is pretty hectic. But uh, if you handle that, then there are other people who get Nobel Prizes, and so they go after them and leave you alone. So now it's, it's pretty good. It's back to normal, I would say. Okay. Um, but certainly, it's, it, it's changed uh, one aspect of my life, and that's uh, recognition and authority, if you like, although I try not to speak about anything that I don't know something about and have so far managed to do that. Um, but uh, it hasn't changed the science. I mean, I still have about the same size group and have to submit proposals and get money, and people think that they just give me money by the bucket load, but it's not true. You have to actually earn it. Let me um, turn to the current scientific challenge, the major one that's going on in your laboratory. Uh, it involves nitrogen fixation. Uh, tell us what drew you to that problem, especially in light of all the work that's gone on uh, previously uh, with regard to nitrogen fixation, and converting nitrogen into ammonia. It was Scott Rockledge in my lab in about 1980. So we had just uh, discovered the, the ability of these alkylidines to react with ketones, especially tantalum ones. Not so much tungsten and molybdenum. They turn out to be relatively stable towards ketones. Uh, and Scott Rockledge was doing a Wittig-like reaction with um, well, CME2 and NCME2, and diacetone, I've forgotten what, what it was, what's its trivial name, but he would uh, do a Wittig reaction uh, at each end and make tantalum in in tantalum where the N2 was basically a, a dianion. So these were diimido tantalum species. But you could view them as dinitrogen complexes too. And then he showed that you could make them from dinitrogen by reducing tantalum and capturing dinitrogen. And so that got me interested into, in the possibility of actually reducing dinitrogen catalytically. That was 1980. You've been successful in certain ways with regard to converting nit nitrogen into ammonia in a uh, stepwise process. Um, how do you think this will move forward towards, uh, let's say, uh, true high-level catalysis? It's actually a truly catalytic reaction. So you have protons at room temperature and pressure, protons and electrons, which usually make hydrogen. So that's the competing reaction. 
So you have to have reactions that will compete with formation of hydrogen. So they have to be very, very good. I never thought I would do that, but it turns out that we can make eight equivalents of ammonia. So four turnovers, not dramatic. There's a very long way to go to compete with something like the Haber-Bosch process, which is the most successful process of the 20th century. Uh, catalytic process, industrial process, I think you could argue that. It's doubled the population of the Earth. It's allowed life to you know, multiply many fold. So how to turn what we've discovered into something that would compete with, with that uh, process is almost unimaginable, but it's possible. We've shown that it can be done outside of a nitrogenase, a naturally occurring enzyme. And so we should be able to engineer it to make it practical, but it's a huge, huge challenge. Meanwhile, it's fundamentally very interesting. It is fundamentally very interesting, yes. I've learned quite a lot. I get involved in electrochemistry and think about solid state devices that you might construct to bring in protons and electrons and make ammonia. So there are some things out there that um, I think about and are possible, but they're very, very challenging. When you were, um, let's say, just starting out, you spent a lot of time working in the laboratory. And uh, today, uh, you, you have a fairly substantial group. Uh, two questions. One is, how do you manage a larger group? And two, what advice would you have for uh, scientists who are just starting out? Well, my group has never been depends what you call large, but it's been between 12 and 15. Once I got up to 20, and that was too large for me. And at MIT, of course, and as well as other places, it's costly to keep a group that big, and I wanted to work on problems that were interesting to me, not just going to bring in more money. So I, I maintained a group of 12 to 15 or so, which I guess you could call a substantial group. And I did work in the lab initially when my group was five or six, and that's very important initially to establish uh, some sort of contact with, with the students almost a, on a daily basis and do, do reactions with them. And so I would advise uh, people just starting out to do that. And I think many uh, that I know of do, in fact. They work in the lab. Initially, of course, they have to because they're no students. So. Uh, and then, um, you know, what, what was another part of that question was uh, advice as far as funding or attracting you know, in students terms, and in, in terms or of finding a way, finding chemistry that excites you. That's certainly a, something that you should do. With regard to um, young investigators today, uh, how would you advise them with regard to communicating their science? Um, we're, in, we're in a time when I think uh, science needs to have, and I'll put it in quotes, a purpose. Uh, has to have some potential use. Uh, the alkylidine complexes at that time, maybe you were able to see the use, maybe not, but they were fundamentally new and different and uh, exciting because they were new and different. Um, what would you tell young scientists today about how to communicate their science? Uh, well, I think um, you've got to be doing something that you love and that you really get excited about, because that's certainly going to come across if you communicate one way or the other, whether you uh, give talks or you write papers, the excitement of the science. Uh, it has to be something that you hope is new and excites other people. Um, I think pretty much the same formula works. You, you've got to get out, go to conferences, get ideas from other people at conferences. Some of my best ideas are when I'm sitting in another talk and hear something that you know, I, I didn't think about because it's in another field and it's orthogonal to what I do. Um, certainly publish as much as you can. Uh, and I would like to say don't oversell what you've done, because it 
really shows. There's a lot of that going on these days. It seems like you have to sell what you've done, and uh, sometimes it's uh, too much. That leads actually into the next question I had for you, which is to compare the funding picture that you saw when you were starting out versus what you see today and perhaps what the criteria are for uh, receiving funding when you started out and what they are today. So when I started out, it was 1975 at MIT, and I don't recall when I wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation, but it might have been right around the time I moved or shortly after I arrived. And there was a guy named Oren Williams at uh, NSF at that time, and he saw the value of investing in a few people that he thought would be the stars of the future, and so he funded me, and right from the beginning, the first year I was there, I was lucky enough to get five students, so that was a pretty substantial initial group, and um, I won't say it was easy for me. I, I, I got NIH support for nitrogen reduction in the early 80s, maybe 81, based on this chemistry that uh, Scott Rockledge had done. And then other things, uh, Department of Energy for polymerization reactions and so on. And, um, but it, it was, it, my, my research went the way that it naturally went because I was interested in it because somebody would fund that work, not for a huge group, not a huge collaboration, a couple people to keep it going. And I think it's still possible to do that today, but there are pressures of all sorts uh, pushing in other directions. Projecting ahead, Dick, uh, how do you think chemical research will change uh, in the future? Well, there's a big push, as you know, towards applications, towards uh, group projects, um, funding for uh, large, uh, uh, significant uh, projects, what, whatever they might be, these, these uh, very challenging projects. And the debate is whether that approach is better than the single investigator approach. And I don't, I don't think the, the conclusion is, is, has been reached yet, in my opinion. Um, so I, I, I think we're going to see more of that, however, more group, group efforts and um, granting uh, to a group of people that then have to run an organization kind of to, to do research and not necessarily produce more interesting science. So we'll see how it, how it works out. So that's a challenge really in, in a sense you built the collaborations based on the success of the chemistry that you had. And here, uh, what you're saying is we're almost forced into collaborations before the chemistry is getting done. Right, right. And it, it's been, it's worked very well for me. Maybe it won't work for everyone. And of course, you have to have the chemistry that would allow those collaborations to happen. So polymerization, uh, especially of uh, ring opening metathesis type polymerization, which I'm back to, to doing now based on these new catalysts that we discovered and organic applications. Um, the collaboration with Amir Hoveda has been amazing and uh, they are actually doing wonderful inorganic and organometallic chemistry out there. A couple of people are really doing well and we don't do the equivalent organic chemistry, I must admit, although we do a few reactions. I'm, I'm mainly the, the catalyst guy, and, and they are the organic group. Let me turn to publications for a minute. Uh, the, your career, your independent career, started just about a decade after inorganic chemistry, the journal, started. and. Um, couple of things. One is how uh, have you seen the journal evolve over the years? And um, uh, another is um, how do you see a journal such as ours that's in, a, that's in a fundamental core discipline change as we move to increasingly interdisciplinary science? Well, I, I think it has changed in that 
direction. Uh, every journal changes, um, subjects come and go, and I think inorganic chemistry has, has changed as it, as it might over a period of uh, however many years it is, 40 some years. Well, it's going to be 50 years. It's our anniversary. That's what we're doing this for, yes. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's, a, that's a big number. So in the beginning, of course, you, the journal was full of problems that were important in, in 1965 or so. And, and um, that, that has changed quite a bit, of course. The problems are much different. Um, they're more broad in scope. I mean, chemistry is expanding all the time. And yet, we have to maintain the fact that inorganic chemistry is really at the source of a lot of uh, the applications and you have to focus on the inorganic chemistry, but certainly the, the applications and the breadth of what you have to cover has, has increased dramatically. What particular challenges do you see uh, for the communication of science, communication of chemistry, for a journal like inorganic chemistry, but for all scientific journals. What challenges do you see going forward? How will things change? Well, I can't predict how they will change, but I can tell you that certainly uh, internet access and the like has changed the way people read journals and the way they, they, they educate themselves. I, I know almost nobody who sits back like you and I used to and pick up a stack of journals, pick up the first one and start, start going through them. That brings me to the way that we uh, read, quote, unquote, today. We don't, we don't have a stack of journals and go through them page by page. Everything's online. You don't even have a hard copy anymore. And you go through the table of contents and you look at the flashy things in the table of contents. And there's sometimes more flash than, than substance. But, um, and, you, and you read a little bit, maybe based on, on what you see, but um, it, it's probably going to continue in that direction. More and more online, maybe even online publishing, which is coming along, which I don't take part in now. But it's going to be a challenge to maintain people's interest uh, 10 years from now. I have no idea how they're going to read, quote unquote, or if they even will anymore. That's, that's an interesting well, question. They'll, they'll read, but uh, they won't necessarily read from paper. And um, I, th I think we're, we're in, if things have changed so dramatically in the last 15 years, uh, it's very hard to predict where we will be, but it will be different. And uh, I guess you and I will be tweeting to each other or doing something else. <laughs> Any old folks home, yes. <laughs> I, hope, I hope not, and I hope that you'll be continuing to do your uh, uh, phenomenal research as you've done over the years. Um, were there any teachers that uh, you found stimulated that interest that you were developing in chemistry? Uh, I would say in high school, I didn't. I don't recall that I was uh, especially drawn to chemistry because of my teacher, although I think he was a, a good chemistry teacher. I had at that point known quite a bit. I was kind of self-taught, as I told you, through this laboratory that I built in my house. And I, I got equipment uh, from a teacher named Harry Daly at Decatur High School. He would give me a few flasks and beakers and some some textbooks, and so that, Harry was probably, at a young age, one of my more stimulating teachers. And uh, my brother, Ted, who's five years older, had Harry as a, as a teacher in high school, and he passed away a few years ago. But other than that, I would say uh, probably John Osborne, and then people after him, um, uh, people like George Parshall, and, 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 and others, even Earl Mutertes uh, in the early days at DuPont were certainly um, people I greatly respected and, and kept me moving forward. Tell us a little bit about uh, John Osborne. He was a personal friend and uh, unfortunately passed away about a decade ago. Uh, he obviously a uh, well-known person in, in certain ways because of his association with Jeff Wilkinson and uh, the Wilkinson Catalyst. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, John. 
Well, scientifically, he was the one, when I went to Harvard, who drew me into his office, and I became his first student after talking to him about catalysis, and he told me what he had done with Jeff Wilkinson. And I thought that was great. And in my four years at Harvard, he was uh, actually a, a personal friend because I was you know, only four years different in, in age, younger than him. And you, back in those days, you'd go out drinking after you know, did experiments and go out to dinner together and all that sort of stuff. And uh, even do some other things, which uh, you know, I don't have to go into. But uh, we spent a lot of time together. And so he was a, a very close friend over the years and scientifically taught me a, a huge amount, allowed me to do what I wanted to do, even if it probably wasn't the best uh, experiment, uh, and really taught me to be self-sufficient and, and think for myself. And I know that scientifically you had great success with uh, rhodium uh, hydrogenation catalysts, right. different from the Wilkinson catalyst. Yeah, I, I kind of was, drew, was drawn to, to the rhodium system, and in particular cationic species. And John was a little hesitant to go there because that's what he did with Wilkinson, neutral, you know, tri trisphosphine and rhodium chloride, you know, so-called Wilkinson's catalyst. Um, but nevertheless, he let, he let me do it. And it turns out that the cationic rhodium complexes are still around today, very important in terms of asymmetric hydrogenation and so forth, none of which I, I did. I did the basic discovery of them. But, Occasionally, I still see a bisnorbonadiene rhodium cation being treated with phosphines and being used for hydrogenation or whatever. There are other things that they're used for. So, yeah, he allowed me to, to continue sort of uh, his own work, probably not um, entirely enthusiastically because of the fact that it, you know, he had to strike out in a new direction, which he ultimately did, but he nevertheless allowed me to do that. Importantly, they were, the, as you pointed out, the predecessors for asymmetric hydrogenation catalysts that were developed um, beginning with Knowles and uh, the people at Monsanto. Yeah, at that time, the, those results were just coming out. And there was a guy at uh, Harvard named uh, Noyori, who was a visitor in, in E.J. Corey's lab. And he was in contact with John, and he had not done transition metal chemistry before. And John had me go make some Wilkinson's catalyst, and he gave it to, to Noyori to play around with, and he's had a pretty good career since then. I don't take credit for that, but it's just, just an anecdote. But it was just great interaction. <laughs> and uh, you know, John is a unique individual, was a unique individual, and. Those who know him well, well really appreciate what he was outside the lab as well as inside the lab, and he's greatly missed. I'm, I'm going to see his, his wife, Karen, in fact, in, in another week or so. I maintain contact with her, and she still lives in Strasbourg. I want to thank you, Dick, very much for uh, joining us today and for giving us your insight, and I want to thank you for joining us as well. And, I uh, look forward to seeing you at the next one of these interviews. Thank you.